When it comes to diversity, the tech industry tends to fall short. That's why Portland Women in Technology is committed to helping underrepresented groups find opportunities in tech. Each year, they survey the state of the community to find out what needs changing. And in 2019, the survey is bigger than ever. Founder Megan Bigelow joins us to talk about the results and what it means for the tech industry in the Northwest. From KGW News, this is Straight Talk with Laurel Porter. Hello and welcome to Straight Talk. I'm Laurel Porter. The technology sector is an important part of the Portland Metro job scene. It's predominantly led and managed by white men. The number of white women is small, 14% at the professional level. But when you look at Latinx and black women, that number is well below 2%. The nonprofit group Portland Women in Technology, or PDX WIT, was founded to encourage those who identify as women, non-binary, and the underrepresented to join tech and support and empower them to stay in tech. The group has just released its annual State of the Community, a survey that examines what it's like for people in tech and what areas need to be addressed. And this year, the group found plenty, and a lot that surprised them. Here to tell us what their research found, what can be done to make tech in Portland and across the country more diverse and inclusive, welcome to my guest, Megan Bigelow, the founder of PDX WIT. Welcome back to Straight Talk. It's great to be here. You were here last year and we talked about your survey, yes. but this year's report is bigger. You cast a wider net. Tell us about the survey this year. Yeah, so last year we had 800 people respond to the survey. And this year, after a lot of uh, very intentional effort to cast a national net, we had over 5,000 people respond. So this very large data set allowed us to cut data into different dimensions that we weren't really expecting to be able to do. How did you conduct the survey? Yeah, so we, um, I mean, the survey itself was a matter of like iterating over questions that we've been including in surveys since 2017. And uh, we had a PR firm, a wordsmith, help us get the word out. And we just really allowed social media and word of mouth to just let it ride out in the, in the, in the world, and it worked. So you had more than 5,000 people exactly. respond. When we talk about women in technology, paint a picture for us. What kind of careers are we talking about? Yeah, we're talking about, uh, well, for our particular uh, group, we, are, we have a broad application of what that means. So we could be we include engineers, that could be developers, technical writers, managers, finance, HR, so people that work in the tech industry but don't necessarily have technical jobs or people who do have technical jobs. So tell us about your group, Portland Women in Technology, mm -hmm. that you founded. Yes. So uh, as you mentioned earlier, we have the purpose of encouraging those who identify as women, non-binary, and underrepresented to join tech and support and empower them so they stay in tech. We do this over a number of ways. We have six events per month that encourage these people to come together and network and find jobs. We have a job board, we have a mentorship program. We just recently launched a scholarship program. So we help fund people to attend conferences because those conferences are pretty expensive. When we break down your survey, you use a term that a lot of people might not be familiar mm -hmm. with. It's CIS. Yes. Help us understand what that means. Yes, yeah, so that's cisgendered. And what that means is that you were born with the gender that you identify with. So in my case, I was born female, and I also identify as a woman. So you are... I am cis. cis, yes. Okay, so when we say cis individuals, we're talking about somebody that identifies with the gender they were born with, so exactly. probably most people in your survey. Yeah. How, how does it break down on your survey? Yeah, so our survey actually had very... Um, uh, like exciting uh, dimensions in, t in terms of representation across a lot of different lines. So we were very intentional about making sure we had very exhaustive list of gender identifications and racial identifications. And so what we found is that each category had at least 5% representing them, which is excellent compared to last year in which predominantly our survey was white and predominantly our survey was cisgendered. So we're going to see that when we break down yes. some of these uh, results. But first, I want to talk about the culture in mm -hmm. different companies. You talk about the culture as being 
two different things, the articulated yep. culture and the expressed yep. culture. Exactly. What's the difference? Articulated culture is the culture that is out in the world, it's like the culture that the company says it has. So if you go to their website, you'll see things like, we're a fun place to work, we enjoy each other's company, we work really hard, that's articulated culture. Expressed culture is the culture that people actually experience. And so when we did our survey this year, it was really important to us to make sure that we were collecting that information. Because oftentimes, the articulated culture is not anywhere close to what people feel and experience when they work there. So company talk versus what people experience. Yes. What did you find about tech companies in general? Is there a big difference, a gap between those two cultures? Yeah, so what we didn't do is measure the actual, like, I guess I should say that the companies that people, this was an anonymous survey, so we don't actually know the companies that they work for to compare how they relate. But what we found is that a very low number of people actually feel like their companies are diverse or that their companies are um, you know, good places to work, even though most tech companies, if you look at their website, you'll see that like all over their websites. Do you think progress is being made? at these companies trying to bridge the gap between those two cultures? Yeah, I mean, I do, but I think the other data point that we're going to be talking about later shows that there's only a certain category of people that feel like progress is being made. All right, let's break down some yeah. of these results then. Uh, surprising findings, and you yes. and I chose about four of them to talk about here today. So the first one is cisgender individuals. Again, that's people who identify with the gender they were born with. 41% mm -hmm. feel as though their ideas are ignored overlooked or unattributed. That is almost triple the amount of trans and or gender non-confirming individuals who feel that way at 13%. This really surprised me because I would think it would be just the opposite, exactly. that people who were underrepresented would feel more exactly. like their ideas were not being heard. Did that surprise you and how do you oh, explain that? Yeah, that surprised me. And I mean, the other element of the data that you didn't mention is that overwhelmingly white women feel this, that their um, ideas are over, you know, overlooked, whereas their counterparts who are considered black, indigenous people of color, that, that was far, they've reported that far less. And so I'll be honest, like that data was really hard for me to really sort of understand. When I saw it, I thought it was wrong. And let me just say that we had a professional help us analyze this data. And I went to him and I was like, is this correct? Like, am I understanding this correctly? And he assured me that that was the data. And so after sort of consulting with friends in the community, people that I can trust, I mean, the, the feedback was, Megan, the first thing you need to understand is as a white woman, a white cis woman, that your struggle is not the same as everyone else's struggle. So what I learned from that is, as a white cis individual, uh, I experience certain things in the workplace. And I, like it sounds like you may have done by seeing that data, extrapolate what you experience to just mean that other people would experience it more. But it's actually not the same struggle. And so when I talked to people, they were saying it's a privilege to be considered a woman in the workplace. It's a privilege to have a seat at the table in which your ideas are overlooked. And so having that changed everything about how I thought about my positioning and where I was at work. Like if I have a seat at the table, like that's a powerful position, even if at times my ideas are being overlooked. Let me be clear, having my ideas or being interrupted or undervalued in meetings is not something that I wanna stand up for and we wanna solve for that. But what is clear to me and to the organization is that in order for us to solve that, we have to understand the full scope of the problem so we can solve the, the issue holistically. Let me see if I'm in understanding. Yeah. So some of the underrepresented individuals who might have responded don't even feel like they're getting a place at the table to have their voices be overlooked. Right. And maybe some of the issues they're struggling with are not are different and this one isn't maybe at the exactly. top of their list. Exactly, and I actually I've been going, I've been touring and doing talks with this data at different companies and I've had people come up to me privately and say, you know, the reason why I didn't answer yes to that question is because I don't care. That's not something I'm worried about. I have other things to worry about.
So maybe do you think next time you'll break that down oh, even yes. further? Oh my goodness, yes. So I have a, a bunch of ideas of what I, like additional questions that I want to ask. I mean, the point here is that if you ask questions that are specifically within um, a certain experience, in my case, white women, then you're not going to understand the experience of people who aren't white women. And so after hearing from people in response to this, uh, the types of questions that we're going to add are, do you feel whitewashed at work? Do you feel that your gender is um, acknowledged and respected? Do you feel that you are a represent, do you have to represent your entire culture? Do people look to you to train others how to be an ally? These are things that I've never had to worry about. Well, They're that'll be interesting to hear <laughs> the results yes, when you do exactly. that next year. We'll have you back. Here's the second surprising finding. 63% of white individuals are for, far more likely than black, indigenous, and people of color at 30% to recommend underrepresented people to work at their company. Yeah. Does that come back to the articulated versus express culture? Right, exactly. And it, it also um, points to a perception gap, right? So if as a white individual, I have an experience at my company and I believe that it's diverse and I believe that it's inclusive because I feel inclusive, that doesn't necessarily mean other people feel included. And um, so what happens, and I've done this myself, is that because I feel great about a company I work for, I want to invite my friends who may not be white or may not, you know, may not have all the same privilege that I have because I assume that it'll be a great place for them too. But because I don't see the things that they experience, um, it, it just sort of perpetuates this scenario in which we're really only understanding a company based on our own sort of likeness and what, what affects us as opposed to other people. And this is a quote from your report about understanding what diversity means. The way in which tech companies are talking about diversity and inclusion is predominantly resonating with white and or cis folks. The implication here is that as an industry, we do not have a shared understanding of what diversity and inclusion means, perpetuating a narrative that is in and of itself exclusive. How do we change that? Right, so the first thing that I think we need to sort of put out on the table, as you mentioned this in the intro, 75% of executive positions in tech are held by white men and women. Um, and if it is those white men and women who are directing and funding diversity and inclusion initiatives. So those individuals are really making decisions about what is diversity and inclusion. And if they're doing it from their own experience, it only is serving other white people. And so to change that, it's a very intentional process for people at the top to educate themselves, peel back the layers. And when I say educate, I don't mean get a degree. I mean, educate yourself on um, the history of this country, the history of the city, of the city you live in, um, a lot of other elements of context that really drive how people sort of show up. Um, learn about anti-blackness. Um, that's not something that someone like me is going to necessarily know and see unless I educate myself on what it is. So having more diverse voices in setting policy is important. And I want to read another quote yep. from your report. This is from a respondent to your survey underscoring the different experience an underrepresented person might have from a white and or cis individual. This person wrote, the sense that now that I'm here, queer Latina, our team as a whole is diverse and our work here is done. Mm -hmm. I sometimes feel tokenized or like others are using me as a shield. Yep. Stop making the trans narrative about single topics, bathrooms, pronouns, mm -hmm. healthcare. We are people first not a topic. How do you feel about what that person was saying to you in that survey? Yeah, I mean, it's a very powerful message and I think one that is happening all over the place and so we're just proud to be able to surface it and I think it really embodies sort of um, counter to the narrative that a lot of people in charge see their diversity and inclusion initiatives. I think oftentimes people think, well, we have someone who isn't a white individual in our office, that means we're diverse, like we've solved for this. That's not true, you haven't solved for it. And in fact, that person is probably working in a scenario that um, is not necessarily the most inclusive or supportive or um, productive for them. Um, and and see the, the, to, to respond to the woman who said, I feel like a shield, I mean, the people that are surrounding her in her workplace are not educated in how they're treating her and how the things that they say and do um, are affecting uh, how she feels about working there. 
And don't you wish you could actually talk to her in person and, and I find do. out more? <laughs> I do. We have another surprising finding, and this one is involving pay mm -hmm. and people's pay. Of respondents posed with this question, if you found out you were underpaid relative to your coworkers, would you ask for a raise? Trans and or gender non-confirming individuals, 21% of them, and black, indigenous, and people of color individuals, 19%, said they would not ask for a raise out of fear of retaliation. Yeah. What do you take away from that finding? Yeah, so what's really important about this is that we acknowledge the national uh, narrative around pay. Now we know that white women are making 70 cents on the dollar, whereas indigenous, Latinx, black women are making far less than that, 52 cents, 58 cents, 61 cents. And um, so there's a there's an oppressive system that is not that needs to be broken because it's the people who are paid at a national level the least feel retaliation the most. So if they can't ask for a raise, they're not going to be in a position of getting more money, right? If people's jobs are so critical to their livelihood, why would they risk that? So how do we break that cycle? It, again, it starts at the people at the top. We need to ensure that those individuals are educated and that they themselves especially if they come from a place of privilege like myself as a white individual to educate other people and to ensure that policies and practices um, are supportive of the people who need the most uh, theories like the people who are historically are the most oppressed are the ones who have the most clearest picture of reality we should be defining diversity and inclusion based on that Megan Bigelow, it's time for us to take a break, but we have more to talk about. When we come back, we'll talk about harassment in the tech workplace. Has that changed since the last survey? We're back in two minutes.